past a certain level of complexity, every system starts looking like a living organism. In order to build a general intelligence, uh, you need to be optimizing for generality itself. We are surrounded by isomorphisms, just like a kaleidoscope. It creates a remarkable richness of patterns from a tiny little bit of information. Generalization is the ability to mine previous experience to make sense of future novel situations. Generalization describes a knowledge differential. It characterizes the ratio between known information and the space of possible future situations. To what extent can we analogize the knowledge that we already have into simulacrums that apply widely across experience space? So intelligence, which is to say uh, generalization power, is literally sensitivity to abstract analogies. And that's in fact all there is to it. In today's show, we are joined by Francois Cholet. I have been using the Keras library for many years. I also read his deep learning with Python book, which was inspiring. And I discovered his racy Twitter feed. When I worked for Microsoft, I used to run machine learning seminars and workshops and hackathons. I used to travel around the world and I always had a copy of Francois's book under my arm. It never left my side. I used to force everyone to read the first four chapters of that book and of course the chapter on the limitations of deep learning before we did anything. Francois has a clarity of thought which is unparalleled I think in any other human being on the planet. It's really quite incredible. Indeed even our own Dr. Duggar who normally has no trouble at all finding holes in some of our guests work had this to say while prepping for the show. I am working on it. It turned out to be a little bit more difficult than I thought. Chalet is a little bit too reasonable. Yeah, do you like my Dugar accent? He, he would enjoy me doing that. But um, anyway, Chalet is extremely controversial to some people actually, but he's not controversial to us. Our discussion today lies at the intersection of machine learning and reasoning. Now Chalet has made his vision completely clear about what he thinks the future of machine learning is. Make no mistake, what you should take from today's episode is that the future of artificial intelligence is going to be discrete as well as continuous. Actually, the two are going to be enmeshed. The future of AI will almost certainly involve a large degree of program synthesis. Deep learning has its limits. You can use deep learning for continuous problems where the data is interpolative and has a learnable manifold and where you have a dense sampling across the entire surface of the manifold between which you need to make predictions. For Cholet, generalization itself is by far the most important feature of intelligence and of developing strong AI. He describes a spectrum of generalization starting with, for example, a chess algorithm where there is no novelty to adapt to whatsoever. The task is fixed. The machine learning we have today confers some adaptation within a known domain of tasks. For example, being able to recognize dogs or cats within a variety of different poses and lighting conditions. What's not been robustly demonstrated so far is broad generalization, adaptation to unknown unknowns within a known but broad domain. It's certainly true that we're knocking on the door of this now with GPT-3 where the subtask, if you like, is given at test time. Although Cholet would make the argument that the subtask isn't learned at test time. Everything that GPT-3 knows was learned on the vast amounts of training data that we trained it on. The poet algorithm from Kenneth Stanley et al. That appears to be meta-learning tasks as part of the training process, which is very, very interesting. So it's creating new problems and new solutions as part of the training process. But broadly speaking in the machine learning space at the moment, the task that we are doing is fixed and not generalizable. The other thing is that the real world does not have a static distribution. We need systems that can adapt dynamically. Intelligence requires that you adapt to novelty without the help of the engineer who helped you write the system. 
Cholet has come up with a formalism of intelligence that balances the task skill, the difficulty, the knowledge and experience to effectively quantify and normalize an algorithmic information conversion ratio. It's the ability to convert experience into future skill that is Cholet's measure of intelligence. At the end of his measure of intelligence paper, Francois introduced the ARC challenge. It became a Kaggle competition as well, and it introduced a massive diversity of tasks. The reason we have a diversity of tasks is for developer-aware generalization. Any model that we have needs to generalize to tasks that the developer was unaware of. And Cholet thinks that intelligence is specialized. It needs to be human centric or anthropocentric. So the kind of priors that you need to solve these intelligence tasks need to represent the kind of priors that us humans have. Now, machine learning algorithms are completely ineffective against the ARC challenge because it's so challenging to generalize from a few examples. The only solutions that were effective in the ARC challenge were program synthesis. The manifold hypothesis is that natural data forms lower dimensional manifolds in its embedding space. There are both theoretical and experimental reasons to believe this is true. If you believe this, then the task of a classification algorithm is fundamentally to separate a bunch of tangled manifolds. The only way deep learning models can generalize is via interpolation. Most perception problems in particular, according to Francois, are interpolative. Neural networks not only have to represent the manifold of the data that they're learning, the manifold also needs to be learnable, and that's an even tougher constraint. Gradient descent will not learn data that has challenging discontinuities in its manifold. It'll just resort to memorizing the data. Deep learning allows you to represent complex programs that you couldn't write by hand, but on the other side of the coin, it also fails to represent very simple programs that you could write by hand, discrete programs. So there are some problems where deep learning is a great fit, and there are other problems where deep learning is a disaster. And the reason for that is that they are not interpolative in nature. These tend to be algorithmic reasoning problems. Francois thinks that 99% of software written today with code is not interpolative in nature, and therefore it's a bad fit for deep learning. The only answer to these problems is discrete program search. To use deep learning for these problems requires a lot of data, it's hard to train, and the representation will be glitchy. It'll be brittle. Neural networks cannot even extrapolate the scalar identity function, f of x equals x. They can only interpolate given the existence of a smooth manifold in the latent space. Jan LeCun recently said to Alfredo that all high dimensional machine learning is extrapolation. So is this similar to interpolation? Well, I mean, all of machine learning is similar to interpolation, if you want, right? When you train a linear regression on scalar values, you're training a model, right? You're giving a bunch of pairs, X and Y. You're asking what are the best values of A and B for Y equals AX plus B that minimizes the, the, the square error of the prediction of a line to all of the points, right? That's linear regression. That's interpolation. All of machine learning is interpolation. In a high dimensional space, there is essentially no such thing as interpolation. Everything is extrapolation. So imagine you are in, in a space of images, right? So you have a color images, 256 by 256. So 200,000 uh, dimensional input space. Even if you have a million samples, you're only covering a tiny portion of the dimensions mm -hmm. uh, of that space, right? Th those images are in a, a tiny sliver of, of surface among the, the, the space of all possible combinations of values of pixels. And so when you show the system a new image, it's very unlikely that this image is a linear combination of previous images. What you're doing is extrapolation, not interpolation. Okay. And in high dimension, all of machine learning is extrapolation, which is why it's hard. I'm being brave calling out Jan LeCun, the godfather of deep learning. But hear me out. It's certainly true that interpolation on the native data domain is useless, right? We need to pull some useful information out of the data and the model architecture and training method matter a lot here. We can all agree that interpolation on the learned manifold would seem like extrapolation in the original space of the data, right? Cholet is quite clear that neural networks only generalize through interpolation. You might argue that you can go a tiny step outside of the convex hull of your data, even by a tiny little bit, and you can technically extrapolate. 
Well, I would argue that if the manifold doesn't give you any useful information outside of the training range, then it wouldn't be any better than finding your nearest training example and just adding a bit of random noise. If you train a GAN, for example, you can interpolate on the latent manifold, but interestingly, you can extrapolate. But the reason for that is the natural manifold that the data of faces sits on might be shaped like a football or a sphere which means if you go outside of the training range, you actually have some information about those data points. The scalar identity function might seem like a contrived example, but it's a really interesting one. When you go outside of the training range, nothing about the manifold is known, right? Think about the manifold. It's just a string that goes on forever. We don't know anything about that manifold outside of the training range. This is not true for most perceptual problems in deep learning. And this is why image models, for example, suffer greatly drawing straight lines. What are your thoughts about this? Why don't you let us know in the comments section on YouTube? So there's a real interesting dichotomy of continuous problems versus discrete problems that we're going to be exploring in the show today. It's very interesting that brittleness works both ways, depending on the discreteness of the problem. Program synthesis would be extremely brittle in classifying cats versus dogs or even MNIST, and deep learning would be extremely brittle predicting the digits of pi or prime numbers or sorting a list. So brittleness here means the overall fit of your model or your program, so accuracy and robustness. Imagine if every single bug you experienced with computer software was entirely unique to you and the development team wouldn't even be able to reproduce it. This is what would happen if software was written entirely with neural networks. It would be more, not less brittle. Cholet thinks that motivated thinking is the primary obstacle to getting people to wake up to the fact that neural networks are poorly suited to discrete problems. The people who are good enough at deep learning to realize its limitations are too invested in its success to say so. Cholet fundamentally thinks that there are two types of thinking, type one and type two. He thinks that every single thought in our minds is not simply one or the other. Rather, it's a combination of both types, type one and type two. They are enmeshed together in everything you think and in everything you do. Even our reasoning is guided by intuition, which is interpolative in nature. Cholet thinks that abstraction is key to generalization and the way we perform abstraction is different in continuous versus discrete space. We need to find analogies and those analogies will be found differently in both of those different spaces. Program search allows us to generalize broadly from just a few examples. It marks a significant deviation from traditional machine learning. Rather than trying to interpolate between the examples you have, you're constructing an entire search space from scratch and testing if it fits our training data. It all started with the flash fill feature in Microsoft Excel. Do you remember that? You give a few examples of some transformation that you want to perform and it will generate a piece of programming code for you, which means it can generalize that transformation across an entire spreadsheet. It's quite a revolutionary idea. It's been around for about 20 years actually, but what's really making it work now is the idea of using neural networks or a neural engine to guide the discrete program search. We spoke about GPT-3. He thinks that GPT-3 hasn't expanded his knowledge of the world. He says that GPT-3 is not learning any new algorithms on the fly. It's already learned continuous and often glitchy representations of existing tasks during its training. It's completely ineffective against his arc challenge tasks. People often claim that neural networks are Turing complete. No, they're not. A model has a bounded number of nodes and a bounded runtime. It cannot execute algorithms that require unbounded space or unbounded time. For example, could you train a neural network to predict the nth digit of pi? No, you couldn't. You could write a computer program to do it, but you couldn't train a neural network to do it. A simple Turing machine program can do just that, and that is because a Turing machine can access unbounded memory and time. The best thing that neural networks can do is approximate unbounded algorithms, but doing so will introduce glitches. 
For example, one can train a neural network to approximately multiply integers together. Yet, even when learning to multiply fixed width integers, practically sized neural networks introduce errors occasionally. And for a fixed sized neural network, these errors grow more common as the size of the input grows. That said, neural networks are finite state machines. And just as finite state machines can be augmented with unbounded memory and iteration to yield a Turing machine, neural networks can also be automated in the same way to produce a Turing complete computational model. If you want to see a concrete example of the kind of discrete program search that Cholet is talking about, look no further than the recent Dream Coder paper. Yannick just made a video about it. So yeah, it feels like today is the culmination of a year of really hard work and passion from the MLST team. We've worked with so many fascinating people. We've had so many amazing guests on. It really means a lot to us. Today is a very, very special episode. It was my dream from the beginning to get Cholet on, on the show. I know that Cholet is going to say lots of interesting things that will trigger some people and inspire others. And please take to the comment section and tell us exactly what you think. Anyway, enjoy the show. See you next week. Peace out. Welcome back to the Machine Learning Street Talk YouTube channel and podcast with my two compadres, MIT PhD, Dr. Keith Duggar and Yannick Lightspeed Kilcher. Now, um, today we have a very special guest, Francois Cholet. Francois is one of the few leaders in the machine learning space uh, who's caused a massive stir in my thinking. The only other notable one actually being Kenneth Stanley, uh, who we had on recently. My ultimate goal with Street Talk was always to get Francois on the show, and I can't believe that it's actually <laughs> happened. We actually have a rule, by the way, that I'm only allowed to invoke Francois's name about once per show, but that rule will not apply today. So yeah, Yannick and I have made more content on Francois Cholet actually than anyone else by a wide margin. And it's because his work is very thought provoking and disruptive. I spent many weeks actually studying his measure of intelligence paper last year. And of course his recent Europe's workshop was fascinating as well. Almost every single word in my opinion that comes out of Francois's mouth deserves rigorous study. And, and I seriously mean that. So um, Francois thinks that intelligence is embodied. It's a process and it's not just a brain. He's skeptical of the so-called intelligence explosion, and he thinks there's no such thing as general intelligence. All intelligence is specialized. Critically, he thinks that generalization, the ability to deal with novelty and uncertainty, is the most important concept in intelligence. He thinks that task-specific skills tells you nothing about intelligence. He thinks that deep learning only works for problems where the manifold hypothesis applies. For example, problems which are interpolative in nature and when a sufficiently dense sampling of your distribution is obtained. Otherwise, deep learning cannot generalize. Deep learning can only memorize, but it cannot always generalize. And in his recent Europe's presentation, he introduced the concept of program-centric and value-centric generalization, which we'll get into in the show today. But I wanted to move straight on to this concept of deep learning being kind of like a hash table, because this is what Francois thinks. So he says that a deep learning model is kind of like a high-dimensional curve with some constraints on its structure given by inductive priors. And that curve has enough parameters that it could fit almost anything. Right? So if you train your model for long enough, it'll simply memorize your data. And because of SGD, your manifold fit is, is found progressively. And at some point, the manifold will approximate the natural manifold between underfitting and overfitting. And at this point, you'll be able to make sense of novel inputs by interpolating on that manifold. So the power of the model to generalize is actually a consequence of the structure of the data and the gradual process of SGD, according to Francois, rather than any property of the model itself. Last week, Francois, we were talking to Christian Sergedi, and he takes a rather different view because one school of thought is that deep learning models are kind of like searching for a space of possible programs and advocates of GPT-3 make this argument quite strongly. And presumably, Christian Sergedi, he wouldn't be doing what he's doing, which is interpolating between mathematical conjectures, assuming that interpolation space would actually give us new information about mathematics, if he thought that that space wasn't interpolatable. What do you think, Francois? Right. I, I think you've beautifully summarized it, really. Yeah, so uh, interpolation is the origin of generalization in, in deep learning models, and that's very much by construction, by nature, right? Like a deep learning model is 
uh, a very large uh, differentiable parametric model trained with gradient descent. And so the only way it's ever going to be generalizing is your interpolation. This is literally, this, this is what it is, this is what it does. So I think the question, you know, um, are, are deep learning models interpolators or not, is not a super interesting question because it's not an open question. We know they are. But the more interesting question, I think, is what can you actually achieve with the sort of uh, uh, interpolation on this very complex, uh, very high dimensional manifold? And the deep learning models are implementing. What are you know the properties of, of this generalization? What are um, the the tasks for which it will perform well? The tasks for which will not perform well. So I guess one example I could I could give you is um, encoding data with the Fourier transform. Like you know about the Fourier transform, and maybe you know some people will play around with it and they, they will be like, hey, you know, actually the Fourier transform can can draw much more than curves. Look, I made a square with it. Right, and then you would have to point out that no, actually the square uh, you've made it by superposing lots of tiny curves, and it's not in fact a perfect square, right? Because it is made of uh, with yeah, the superposition of lots of tiny curves, and that really uh, this is true by nature, by construction. This is where the Fourier transform does, right? And the re the more the more interesting question is, you know, what sort of data uh, is a good fit for encoding the Fourier transform, and what sort of data is not a good fit? Like if you try to encode uh, the t square fractal. Uh, with the Fourier transform, you're going to have a bad time. And if you try to encode a drawing that's mostly just, you know, nice, uh, smooth curves, then it's going to be a very, very efficient uh, encoding and a good idea. And deep learning is very much like that. We should ask, you know, what are its strong points? What are its weak points? Yeah, so I, I by the way, so I don't believe that deep learning models are hash tables per se. I usually say they are locality sensitive hash tables, meaning that it's kind of like a hash table with some amount of generalization power because they have some notion uh, of distance between points. They are, they are capable of comparing points by um, measuring the distance between them, right? And this this is what would uh, enable uh, this kind of hash table to actually generalize, as opposed to the classic kind of hash table, which is just be uh, memorizing the, the data. It's very interesting that you allude to the fact that, you know, what kind of data is the model good for and so on. And now deep learning models being essentially like really as, as Tim said, like big interpolators of arbitrary manifolds, do you think there is something common across the types of data we choose deep learning for? Or, you know, could we in fact use deep learning for most kinds of manifoldish data? Or do you think there is some kind of specialness about natural signals that makes deep learning very attuned to them? So I think most things are to some extent interpolative, which is why you can actually do lots of things with deep learning models. Doesn't necessarily mean it's always a good idea, but it's it's going to kind of work, right? You know, when, when people hear the word interpolation, they tend to think about linear interpolation. That's what uh, pops up uh, in their mind. But that's not actually at all what deep learning models are doing, right? They are, they are interpolating on this very complex, very high dimensional uh, manifold, and this enables very you know arbitrarily complex behavior, and in practice, it's always possible to an arbitrary, a discrete algorithm in a continuous manifold, right? It's not necessarily a good idea, but it's always uh, possible, at least in theory. So for any program, you can imagine, you can ask, you know, is there a deep learning model that will encode some kind of approximation of it? And the answer is always yes, right? Uh, similar to how you can always encode an arbitrary shape uh, with the Fourier transform. Right, but there are, if you try to do that, actually, there are some issues with that. So there, there are very much, you know, some problems for which deep learning is a good fit, some problems for which deep learning is not a good fit. In the limit, the extreme point is a space that is not interpolative at all, which is quite rare, actually. You know, most spaces, even very discrete kind of spaces, do have, you know, some amounts of interpolativeness. In, um, so, like, but one example would be, for instance, trying to train a deep learning model to predict. Uh, the next prime number, right? Or, or, or to tell whether a number is a prime number. Uh, so you cannot actually do that. The best you can do is memorize the training data point because the space of prime numbers is not uh, interpolated at all. So your deep learning model will always have zero generalization power. But that's, that's actually quite, quite rare. This is kind of an, an extreme case. Most problems, even problems that are by nature discrete, algorithmic problems, there will be some amount of interpolation that you can do, right? But that doesn't necessarily mean that it's a good idea to try to, to solve, you know, uh, such problems with deep learning models. 
for deep learning to be a good idea, you need a, a very, you need very much the, the manifold hypothesis to apply. Uh, so it works best for perception problems. Any problem that humans can solve via pure intuition or perception is probably a good fit for deep learning. But any problem where, where you need, you know, high level, explicit, step by step reasoning is probably a bad fit for deep learning. And you know, ninety nine percent of what today software engineers solve via writing code is going to be a bad fit for deep learning. Uh, that doesn't mean that there wouldn't be, you know, theoretically a deep learning model that can embed the same algorithm in a, in a smooth manifold. This is always possible to, to some extent, right? But there are uh, very significant issues with attempting to do this. Like just because something is theoretically possible doesn't mean uh, you should actually do it. I think we might be not being careful enough when we say what we mean by yeah. program. Because, um, for example, if I take program to be the, the universal sense, like a program is something that can run on a Turing machine, for example, because of the fact that that type of program actually has access to unbounded time and memory computation, it's impossible in the general sense to encode that in any finite neural network. Like I can write a very short piece of code, theoretical Turing machine can output, you know, the nth digit of pi. It's impossible to do that with any finite neural network. Would you agree? Yeah, with that? absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Cause I think that's like a big source of confusion oftentimes with these statements that like, you know, oh, neural networks are Turing complete. Well, no, they're not. They're, you know, if you have a neural Turing machine, which is a neural network that's the finite state machine piece of a Turing machine, that can be Turing complete. But in the general case, you know, finite neural networks, which is what everyone means by neural networks, are not Turing complete. And it actually has practical effects, right? This is why we see this sort of explosion in the number of parameters to kind of, you know, start to accomplish yeah, absolutely, 100%. You, you're, you're entirely right. So we're only interested in uh, realistic programs, like the sort of programs a software engineer would write, for instance. And we're only interested in realistic neural, ne neural networks. And by the way, the constraints that we have on neural networks are actually much stronger than asking, given this program that I have, is there a, a neural network that could embed it in a continuous manifold? The constraint is actually, is there a neural network that, keep, that could not only represent it, but that could learn this embedding of the program from data, and this is uh, uh, several orders of magnitude harder, <laughs> right? Uh, learnability is a big problem because you're fitting uh, your manifold via gradient descent, right? And if the, if the structure you're trying to fit is too discrete with too big discontinuities, gradient descent will not uh, work at all. And the best you can do is, again, just memorize uh, the training data. So I, I can maybe uh, give you a, a concrete example to help kind of ground our discussion here. Um, so in, in 2015, some, some friend of mine, so his name is, he used Keras to do something pretty cool, which actually became a cool example on the Keras website. He used a LSTM model to multiply numbers, but not like uh, numbers multiplied by value, but um, the input of the model would be strings, like two strings, uh, strings of digits. And the LSTM will actually learn the multiplication algorithm for like multiplying three digits and three digit numbers. Kind of the, the sort of algorithm we would learn in primary school, right, uh, to do multiplication. And remarkably, that worked, right? Uh, it works just fine. So you can train a deep learning model to learn this algorithm. And you could, of course, train a transformer model to do the same. It would actually be probably uh, significantly more efficient. But, so that works. That comes, however, with a number of downsides. So first, in order to train that algorithm, which is very simple, you're going to need thousands and thousands of examples, right, of different strategic numbers. And once you've trained your algorithm, because the actual algorithm was embedded uh, in the neural network, it does generalize to never seen before digits, right? So it's actually it's actually learning the algorithm. It's not just learning and just not memorizing the data. But the thing is. Because the embedding of an algorithm, the embedding of a discrete structure in a continuous space uh, is not the same thing as the original discrete object. There are glitches. Your deep learning network, unless that's something you could have found via program synthesis, for instance, 
it's not going to be correct 100% of the time. It's going to be, it's going to be correct 95% you know, of the time. In, in much the same way that if you try to encode a very discrete object via the Fourier transform, it's not going to be correct. It's 100% of the time, it's going to be an approximation and around sharp angles, it's actually going to be wrong. And very importantly, and this is really like the, the algorithm that you've you know, painstakingly embedded into your uh, deep learning model via exposure to data, does only it does not generalize very well. It only does local generalization, meaning that if you train it with three, uh, to multiply three digit numbers, and then you send it a five digit number, is it going to work? No, absolutely not. And not only is it not going to work, but you could not, in fact, uh, uh, few shot fine tune your algorithm to learn to handle five digit, seven digit, and so on. If you want to fine tune your, your algorithm, you're going to need thousands, maybe millions uh, of examples, right? So it's, it's all, uh, local generalization. And lastly, it's, it's super inefficient. Like, I think we can uh, all agree with this, that multiplication is, is not like, it's not, um, uh, a clever use of, of an LSTM. It's you're, you're burning tons of resources uh, for something that is actually super easy. And you can compare that. Uh, like, since we are, we are talking about pros and cons of deep learning, you can compare that to what you could get with a program synthesis engine. Like, I don't want to compare to what you could get with a human written algorithm. Because kind of the point of deep learning is that it enables you to develop programs that you could not otherwise write by hand. So the right point of comparison is actually what you could do with deep learning versus what you could do with discrete uh, program synthesis based on discrete search and the, and the, and the DSL. And if you were to use uh, program synthesis to solve the, the, the multiplication uh, problem, so you would find a solution. Uh, even a very neat engine that has just like uh, maybe you know a plus uh, operation, maybe a loop. And its DSL is going to find it. it. It can find it with a handful of examples. You're not going to need thousands of examples, like in the deep learning case. You're going to need maybe five. And the program you get out of it is going to be exact because it is uh, the exact discrete algorithm. It is not a continuous embedding of it, so it does not have glitches. It it outputs the correct answer. It will be lightweight, so it will be very efficient. You know, and like and like the LSTM or, or transformer model. And crucially, it's going to generalize. So if you develop it only from three-digit numbers, maybe there will be something inside it that will hardcode the assumption that they're dealing with three-digit numbers. But even if that's the case, you can take it and automatically learn a, a, a generalized form of it if you if you just start giving it you know, seven-digit numbers. Very easily because it's just modifying in probably a couple lines of code. So it is capable of strong generalization. So here you start seeing how for a problem that's fundamentally a discrete algorithmic reasoning problem, discrete search is the correct answer. Deep learning, it's possible, it works, but with extremely stark limitations, right? It's very hard to train it. You need tons of data. The resulting embedding, because it's not, it's not discrete, we'll have glitches. Uh, it's not going to work 100% of the time. It's going to be pretty on. It's only going to be capable of local generalization, right? Because again, like the, the, there is a huge difference in representational flexibility right, between your very simple discrete algorithm and some kind of uh, very complex high dimensional continuous embedding of it. Right? And, and then there's also the, the efficiency consideration. So clearly for, if you're dealing, and the, the reverse is also true, right? Like if you're dealing with a problem that's a fundamentally perception problem where you have data points that fit on, on a nice and smooth manifold, then deep learning is actually the right answer. And if you tried to, to, to train a, a, a discrete a program to, to, to develop, you know, via, via program synthesis, an actual algorithm to classify, you know, MNIST digits, for instance. Everything I, I, I just said would be true, but in reverse, your program would be brittle, the deep learning model would be robust, uh, and so on. So there are really problems where deep learning is a great idea, it's a great fit, problems where it's a terrible idea, like try sorting a list with a deep learning model. Can it be done? Yes, actually it can, uh, but with, with all these caveats applying. It is possible to sort a list of deep learning with some hacky inductive priors and probably memorizing most of the training data. And there's, it's not a binary, is it? You said yourself, there's lots of problems that fall in the middle where there is a semi-continuous structure and some regularity, but it's still a, a discrete problem. And you're saying in, in that situation, we should still use program search, but maybe we can use deep learning, maybe something about the shape of the manifold, even though it's semi-continuous, could actually tell us about how to do that program search more efficiently. But it seems to me that if there are problems out there, let's say adding numbers up in GPT-3, when I, when I read the stuff that you've been talking about here, it seems obvious to me. 
Why, why are people not picking up on this? I think you know, most people are not necessarily paying a, a lot of attention to, to the, the nature of deep learning, why it works, why it doesn't work. I also think, you know, the people, like, there are basically two categories of people. They are like lay people and they are people with deep expertise. And the big problem we have here is that the people with a lot of expertise are going to be a lot of the time driven by motivated thinking, right? Because that, you know, like I do, they work in the field of deep learning. And so they're going to have this vested interest in deep learning uh, being, you know, potentially more powerful, more general than it is. I think if you want to think clearly, uh, the primary obstacle is motivated thinking. It's, it's fighting against what you uh, want to be true. So I tend to have super boring opinions in that sense, because I, I, I do my best to try to forget kind of what I would like the world to be in my, in my best interest and try to look at as it really is. And that will tend to actually diminish the importance of my own work. So, yeah, but, you know, uh, I've, I've been doing like deep learning for uh, almost a decade. Of course, I would, I would want it to be like this uh, uh, incredible world changing thing that leads to human level intelligence right off the bat. That would be, that would be awesome. That would be amazing. And that would be right. Uh, uh, in the middle of it, but that's not, that's not actually, uh, what's going on. You said you tend to be, um, what was the word, uh, not, not controversial ideas or something because you try to stick to the way the world is rather than the way you want the world to be. But I, uh, we, we just had Yannick produce an interesting video about how, if you think that machine learning models essentially attempt to do the same thing, right? I mean, they're not human beings. They don't really have wants per se. They're just modeling reality as it is. It turns out reality itself really annoys a lot of people. Like they just don't like reality and they don't like the way the world is and they wish it was something different. And that infects like every mode of their thinking actually. Yeah, no, absolutely. Most people, you know, uh, and that's, that's true for me as well. I, I, I'm, not, I'm absolutely not saying I'm, I'm an exceptionally fool. I'm trying uh, to do my best to resist this, uh, this trend, uh, but I am no exception. Most people have opinions, not because they they've seen evidence in support of the opinion, but because it's in their interest for, for this opinion to be true, or they just want it to be true. I guess one example is, you know, we were, we are mentioning GPT-3 and so on and proponents of GPT-3. I was actually super excited uh, when I initially saw the claim that a pre-trained language model could perform future generalization. I thought uh, that that's, that's super fascinating. I was excited. Like I'm always super excited if I hear about something that's really challenging uh, my, my initial kind of uh, mental model of how the world works. You know, it's like uh, a few years back, uh, there was this claim that a neutrino was measured going faster than the speed of light. I mean, that's, that's, that's exciting, right? That's like new physics. You want it uh, to be true, or at least you want to get to the bottom of it. And then it turned out to be a measurement error, right? So that's, that's, that's disappointing. So I think the GPT-3 is kind of, it's kind of the same for me. I really wanted it to be something, something novel and that would really challenge what I thought to be true by deep learning models. And I, I regret to say that everything I've seen close has actually confirmed in my view that basically deep learning models, they can uh, learn to embed algorithms given sufficient uh, exposure uh, to data, uh, but they cannot really like few shots uh, synthesize novel algorithms uh, that represent a pattern they haven't seen in a training data, which is why, by the way, GPT-3 is entirely ineffective on ARC, for instance. And that, that's, that's kind of sad to me. I, I kind of regret it uh, because it means I haven't actually learned uh, anything uh, from it. It hasn't expanded uh, my view of the world, which is, which is too bad. Like, I wish it did. I wish it did. Um, so yeah, so in the case of GPT-3, what's really going on is that the model has been exposed to, you know, many patterns, but you could call them algorithms, for instance, in many different contexts. And so it has memorized these patterns and now it's able to take these patterns and apply, it, um, apply them to new data in much the same way that the multiplication algorithm we are, we are talking about. Because it's an actual algorithm, it can process new digits. It's not just memorizing the digits in the training data, it's an actual algorithm. In the same way, GPT-3 contains tons uh, of small algorithms, like that. but the model is not synthesizing these algorithms on the fly. They are in the model already, right? And if you try to apply GPT-3 to something for which a new algorithm would, would need to be produced, like an arc task, for instance, it is just completely anything. It, it seems to all build up what you're saying, because there is this 
strong generalization versus local generalization. And then you make a case that in order to do strong generalization, we need maybe something like program synthesis approach. So like deep learning can't necessarily get us there in most problems. And you make an interesting case that something like graph isomorphism search could play a core role in that. Could you like briefly connect all of these terms together of the case you're you're making there because it's super interesting so going back to what uh, uh, tim was saying it's rarely the case that you have problems that are fully interpolative or fully discrete there are definitely such problems in fact most perception problems are, are almost entirely interpolative and most programs the kind of program that humans write they're they're largely like discrete non-interpolative but most tasks actually are best solved via a combination of both. And I actually believe that's true uh, for the way uh, humans uh, think. You know, there's type 1 thinking and type 2 thinking. I, I strongly believe that almost every thought you have and everything you do with your mind is not one or the other. It's a, it's a combination of both. That type 1 and type 2 are really enmeshed, enmeshed uh, into each other in everything you think and everything you do. Um, like for instance, perception, that, that, that looks like something like instant. So very much the, the sort of like, uh, a continuous interpolative thing. In fact, there's a lot of reasoning that's uh, embedded into, into perception. And the reverse is true. For instance, if you look at a, a mathematician, for instance, proving a theorem, what they're writing down on, on the sheet of paper is, is really step-by-step -step discrete reasoning type thing, but it's very much guided by high level intuition, which is very much interpolated. They know where they're going without having to derive the exact sequence of steps uh, to get there. Uh, so they have this like a uh, uh, high level kind of view, kind of like, you know, if you're driving, you have to make discrete decisions because you are driving on a network of roads, right? But if you have a, a, bird, uh, a GPS, for instance, you can kind of see the direction in which you're going, which is interpolative. If you're talking about direction, you're talking about distances, you're talking about geometric spaces. And uh, everything in the human mind kind of follows uh, uh, this model of type one and type two thinking at the same time. If you go back to first principles, intelligence is about abstraction. So intelligence fundamentally is about the ability to face the future, given things you've seen in the past. And the way you do that is yeah, abstraction. You extract from the past some, some construct. Uh, maybe it's a template, maybe it's an algorithm that will actually be effective in terms of explaining uh, the future. And that's what makes it, makes it abstract is that it can handle multiple instances of, of some kind of thing, which that thing is an abstraction, right? And, and it's, uh, if it's abstract enough, it can actually handle instances you've never seen before, right? It does generalization power. And, all abstraction is born from analogy. Like abstraction starts when you make an analogy between two things. Like you say, hey, time is like a river uh, if you want to get philosophical or something. But in, in general, you can just say this apple, it looks similar to this other apple. So there is such a thing as the concept of an apple, for instance. And uh, the path that is shared between the two things that you're uh, uh, relating to each other, the subject of the analogy, that uh, that's the part that can be said to be abstract. That is the part that will help you make sense of the future. Like you encounter a third apple in the future. You know it's an apple because you don't even need to relate it to the apples you've memorized. You just need to, you just need to relate it to the templates, the abstract template of an apple that, uh, that you've formed by, from exposure to different kinds of apples in the past. Um, and if you think about what's, what's an analogy, really, like how do you find an analogy? It's, uh, a way to compare two things uh, to each other. And there are only really two ways to compare things. Um, you can, you can basically ask, um, how similar are they in terms of distance? Like you can say implicitly there's, you're looking at a space of points. There's a distance between any two points. That's, that's the type one a sort of analogy that leads to type one uh, abstractions, which leads to uh, a type one thinking. Right. So a type one analogy is like you have things you say to what degree they're similar to each other. So you read them by distance. You, so implicitly it means you put your things on in a geometric space. Right. Um, and type one abstraction is going to be a template. It's like you're going to have clusters of things. So you can take the average and say 
everything that is within a certain distance of that template belongs to this category. That's, a, that's type one abstraction. It's very much the way deep learning models work. And, and then you, and then you start adding perception and intuition on top of that, which is very much the type one thinking. And the other way you can compare two things is the discrete way, right? That is it. You can say these two things uh, are exactly the same. They have exactly the same structure, or maybe the structure of this thing is a subset of the structure of this bigger thing. So discrete topology grounded comparison. So you have the geometry grounded comparison that's all about distances and, and, and templates. And then you have the topology grounded way of comparing things. That's all about uh, exact comparison or finding uh, uh, subgraph isomorphisms. So in, in the first case, your objects are, are very much points in geometric spaces. So they're, they're vectors. And deep learning is always a great fit for, for this sort of stuff. And in the second case, your objects uh, are going to be graphs, right? And you're, and you're really looking at the structure of these graphs and substructure and so on. And you're doing always, you're doing exact uh, comparisons. And in, in practice, um, most thinking is actually kind of some, some com combination of these two atoms, right? Of these two poles. Uh, you're, you're very rarely just going to say, yeah, this apple is exactly this close uh, uh, to my template of an apple, so it's an apple. You're going to have basically layers upon layers of thinking, and some of them are going to be intuitive. Some of them are going to be more about, you know, comparing structures and so on. What, what you're saying is really interesting, right? Because you invoke the kaleidoscope hypothesis in your paper. And the idea there is that a tiny bit of information, just like in a kaleidoscope, could be uh, represented widely across experience space. So you say that intelligence is literally having some kind of sensitivity to abstract analogies. So the intelligence is about being able to face the future, unknown future, given your past experience. And that fundamentally requires the future to share some commonalities with the past. And that's, that's the, the idea of the kaleidoscope of hypothesis, that the universe and our lives are made of lots of repeated atoms of structure. And in fact, if you look at the source, there are very few things that are, that are unique, that are kind of like the, the grains of sand that are at the origin of all the different kinds of moving patterns you can see in the kaleidoscope, right? So the, the kind of like intrinsic structure contained in the universe is very small, but it is repeated in all kinds of variants, right? And um, the idea is that if you see two things in the universe, that look similar to each other or that share some commonalities, a subgraph maybe. It fundamentally means that they come from the same thing. And that thing is going to be, is going to be an abstraction. It's going to be one of these uh, grains of sand in your, in your kaleidoscope or grains of glass, actually. Um, and intelligence is all about reverse engineering the universe to get back to this source of intrinsic complexity in the universe, to get back to these fundamental abstractions. I think the heart of this conversation goes back thousands of years, because what we're talking about right now is a lot of, say, Platonism, right? Which is that there are these ideal abstract structures, and of course, they, they really thought of them as actually existing in some universe, but you know, even if they, they don't exist in some reality, they at least exist in concept. And it strikes at the heart of this duality that's always been a very that's been one of the central mystery really of a lot of human thinking which is particle versus wave you know discrete versus continuous abstract versus the real versus the messy and you know i think you pointed it out you definitely pointed this out in this call but i think also in some of your papers that in your view you know let's say the ultimate solution or whatever of creating artificial intelligence or, or synthetic intelligence or whatever is a, is a hybrid system that can do both of these types of reasoning, maybe in kind of multiple layers. And, um, you know, I, I'm kind of curious, where is the state of the art now with actually implementing hybrid systems? You know, something like, I don't know, is it capsule networks? Is it the topological neural networks that we talked about? Where, where lies the direction of some type of a hybrid system that in a unified way is capable of doing both of these modes of, of reasoning, if you will. Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So um, I th this is definitely an active field of research, but I think the most promising direction right now is going to be discrete search very much. So a, a system that is discrete search centric, that has a DSA and so on, and that's one of the, it's basically just problems in this engine. But with, it is getting lots of help from deep learning models. 
And there are two ways in which you can uh, incorporate this you know, type one sort of thinking into a fundamentally type two centric system. So one way is, so basically you want to um, apply deep learning to any sort of, of data set where you, you have an abundance of data and your data is interpreted. One example would be being able to use deep learning models to generate a sort of like perception DSL that your discrete uh, search uh, process can build upon. So look at arc, arc tasks, for instance. Uh, a human that is looking at arc tasks, the very first layer through which they're approaching the arc task is by applying basically perception primitives uh, to the grid they're looking at. They are not actually analyzing the grid in a, in a, in a discrete way, like cell by cell, object by object. They're they are approaching it holistically, like what do they see? And these outputs can then discrete concepts. And then you can start, you can start applying discrete reasoning to them. So generating the DSL. And by the way, the, the, the reason it's possible is because humans have access to tons of visual data and, and uh, these different frames share lots of commonalities, right? So it, it is it is an interpretive space where deep learning is relevant, where, you know, where intuition and perception are relevant. And the other way, which is 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 much more uh, difficult and much, much more subtle, I think, is basically being able to provide guidance to the discrete search process, basically because even though one single program, so learning one single program, for instance, for an arc task is not a good fit for deep learning model at all, because you only have a handful uh, of examples to learn from. And the, 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 the program is super discrete. It's not really easily embeddable in a, in a smooth manifold. However, here's the thing, the space of all possible programs, for instance, the space of all possible arc tasks and all possible programs that solve arc tasks is actually very likely gonna be interpolative, at least to some extent. And so you can imagine a deep learning model that has enough experience with, with these problems and, and the algorithmic solutions that it can, it can start providing directions to the search, to the discrete search system. So um, basically you're, 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 you're in a kind of like, you have, yeah, you have like layers of, um, of learning. The, the lowest layer is going to be perceptive. It's going to be learned across many different tasks and many different environments. It's going to be type, type one. Then you are, you're going to have the context specific on the fly problem solving system. That's very much going to be type two. Uh, and the reason it's going to be possible and efficient is because it's going to be guided by this upper layer, which is going to be type one, which is also going to be trained from a very, very long experience across many different problems and tasks. And it is able to do interpolation between uh, different tasks. So can I um, challenge you a, a little bit maybe, because you say maybe, you know, all of these problems and what humans do is a bit of an interpol, like an interpolation between the interpolative systems and the discrete systems. and. I see that going for, you know, something like an arc task or or if you really write code. But if you really come to, let's say, let's say the highest levels of human intelligence, which to me seems to be navigating social situations, which is 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 ultimately like is, is super complex. And I can imagine something like the graph structure you're referring to be, uh, being Let's say I come into a room and I see the graphs as, you know, what kind of social dynamics exist in this room? You know, this is the father of this person and that person's kind of angry at me. And so I need to, you know, do something. And m my question is, how often is that really a dis... Like, how often can you really map this in a discrete way to another graph? Isn't, isn't every situation going to be a little bit different, even in terms of its graph structure. And, you know, if an, if in an arc task, a line is just like a little bit squiggled, any program synthesis approach would have a hard time with it, I feel. Or do you think, or do you think I'm misunderstanding something here? Like how, how discrete is really discrete? That's the, that's the purpose uh, of abstraction. The purpose of, of mm -hmm. abstraction is to uh, erase the irrelevant differences between different instances of the thing and focus on what, on what on the commonalities that matter right so like if the squiggle in your line is not relevant then the proper abstraction for a line should abstract it away i was going to pick up on that because you, your main point basically is that 
program-based abstraction is more powerful than geometric-based abstraction because topology is robust to small perturbations, but it's more than that. It comes back to these analogies, right? So we actually have functions and abstractions in our mind that, as you say, will take away all of the relevant differences, but focus on what's salient and what's generalizable. Yeah, exactly. So in, in the big sense, do you think the type one and type two reasoning are really different or is there also a continuum between them like you, you say we need we need hybrid systems but is there something right yeah. because they're both they're both in the brain they're both on the same neurons like is there a continuum so right so yes and no uh, i do believe they are they are very qualitatively different these are the, the two poles of cognition but there are there are you know most most things we do with our mind a combination of both. That doesn't mean it's, it, it lies somewhere in between. It means it's a direct combination of one pole with the other, kind of like what I described uh, with, uh, with the uh, arc uh, solver with three layers, with two layers that are type one and one layer in the middle that's type two. But in very much the same way that you can uh, embed discrete programs in a smooth manifold, you can also do the reverse. And when you, meaning you can basically encode an approximation of a, of a geometric space using discrete constructs. In fact, if you've done any sort of linear algebra on a computer, that's exactly what you're doing. You're actually manipulating ones and zeros, but somehow, somehow you're, you're able to have vectors of, of seemingly continuous numbers. You can compute the distance between two vectors and so on. All of this is an approximation that's actually grounded in discrete programs. So. You can, you can actually kind of merge the two together. It's not necessarily always a good idea. In particular, I think it's often not a good idea to try to embed a, a, an overly complex or overly dis discrete program in a, in a continuous space, as, as I was uh, mentioning earlier. The reverse is actually uh, usually way more tractable. And by the way, my, uh, I think this is something that, that, that came up before in, uh, in our conversation, but my kind of subjective, totally not backed by any evidence, opinion of how the brain works is that fundamentally it's doing type one and type two using a discrete system because it's actually much easier to do the, to do type one via an approximation of geometric space that's encoded in a district structure than it is to do the, to do the reverse yeah and if i can um if i just for the benefit of the reader uh, the listeners if i can give some other examples you know for example in in mixed integer optimization it's often the case that you take that problem and instead of having these discrete values you project it into a continuous space do a continuous optimization, and then as you get sort of close to a good optimization, you discretize it back over into the the discrete variables, you know, to to kind of, you know, flesh out the most optimal path within that discrete space. Or an example, too, is the gamma function, you know, which is a continuous generalization of the factorial, right? And it kind of provides some cool and interesting behavior in between those those poles that show up very clearly on the graph as these discrete points. And this is this bizarre duality between the continuous and the discrete that we see like throughout the universe. Yeah. And it's kind of one of the strangest things we have to deal with. Yeah, exactly. I, I just wonder what some of the Transformers folks must be saying now, because Max Welling, we had him on and folks have um, done topological applications using Transformers or using graph neural networks. And the, the alpha fold, the thing from DeepMind, that was looking at graph isomorphisms right yeah. it was looking at different types of equivariants um in topological space is it a naive thing to say that we could make it continuous or are we on a hiding to nothing right so i guess i guess the question is is there like one approach that's going to end up being universal and it's it's like can you actually scale deep learning to handle arbitrary discrete programs it's kind of it's kind of the question and the answer is uh, no, actually, like by, by construction, due, due to the very nature of, of what deep learning is, it's like parametric, continuous parametric models, in, in fact, smooth because they're, they're, they're differentiable, showing risk gradient descent. That is never actually uh, going to be a good fit for most discrete programs. So, and, and the reverse is true as well. I don't think, so you have basically two engines that you can use to learn programs. You have quite on this and you have discrete search. And I think the reverse is also true that discrete search is not going to be this universal approach that's going to beat everything. Uh, I, I truly believe that the AIs of the future will be truly hybrid in the sense that they will have these two engines inside them. They will be able to do gradient descent. They will be able to do discrete search, right? and, they, and, they, and they will 
use that appropriately. You, you said, by the way, in your measure of intelligence paper that there are three types of priors, right? Low level sensory motor priors and meta learning priors. That's the interesting one. I think that's what intelligence is and, and high level knowledge. And then we get over to the ARC challenge. And, and as you said in your presentation last year, the two winning folks on that Kaggle challenge, one was doing a genetic algorithm over a DSL. So doing what you're talking about, a kind of program search. And actually the, the winner who got about 20% accuracy. And that, that, that yeah, was, that was just, yeah, that was, um, just doing a brute force, you know, selecting combinations of, of operations on this DSL. So this absolutely fascinates me. So at, at the moment, that seems like a horrific solution, but clearly no one could do oh, any better using deep <laughs> learning. So, but, but this is what you're advocating for. So you're saying for these discrete problems, get, get a DSL. Now, all the stuff you're talking about, presumably they haven't done yet. You're saying, well, software engineering, the beauty of software engineering is being able to modularize things into building blocks. And in fact, I, I love citing this thing actually from Patrice Simhard, but he said, the reason why software engineering is so good is if I ask you, how long will it take you to build the game of Tetris? You will say, not long at all. And, and if you look at the number of state spaces in Tetris, it's, it's huge. But the reason you'll be confident to build it in a couple of weeks is because you know that you can modularize it into, into blocks. You can't say the same for deep learning, right? But they don't appear to have done that on the Arc Challenge yet. Yeah, so the, the solutions we've seen on the Arc Challenge so far have been incredibly, incredibly primitive. And so it's, it's actually uh, quite interesting that you can get to 20%. Uh, it's, uh, it's very, very primitive solutions. I think you can, even with today's technology, you can go much further. Like the, what I was describing before about learning a DSL that is perceptive and then guiding discrete program search. Yeah, intuition about program search. This is already something that you can try today. So there's one approach that I was uh, very excited about and that I thought was, was very cool and I really like. It's, uh, it's called Dream Coder by Dr. Kevin Ellis and, and folks. Um, so check it out if you, if you haven't seen it. It's very cool. I think that they're trying to apply to ARC now, but it's generally like it's this kind of like hybrid deep learning program synthesis uh, engine. And I think that's really, to me, that, that is the sort of direction that is the most promising today. So you have a, a paper that's fairly long on... It's called On the Measure of Intelligence, and you make the case that intelligence is something like the efficiency with which we transform prior information and experience into task solutions, as, as you have said before. And in that same paper, the ARC challenge is presented. So, you know, a naive reader like me assumes there is some connection between you know, what you say about intelligence and solving this ARC challenge. So my, my question is, if tomorrow, you know, a new team comes and gives you a solution, you evaluate it, it gets whatever, 95% correct, it solves the ARC challenge. Is it immediately intelligent? Or like, what would you ask of that system for, for you to say, yes, that's intelligent, or, or it's, it's intelligent is, is high or something like this? So you, you, you would be able to make that, that conclusion if and only if ARC was a, was a perfect benchmark. But it's not. It's actually very much flawed. So if you solve ARC, are you, are you intelligent? Um, well, no, because ARC is potentially flawed. That's, that's the thing. So the thing you need to, to really understand about ARC is that it's not kind of the end state of this intelligence benchmark. It is very much a work in progress, and there will be new iterations, especially as we learn more about the flaws. And by the way, so last year we ran a Kaggle challenge on Arc, and we learned a ton, not necessarily a ton about program synthesis approaches, although there, there were some cool stuff with Cellular Automata and so on, but mostly we learned about the flaws uh, of Arc. So there will be future editions and so on. So I will tell you this. Um, if you solve the specific test set of ARC as it exists today, you're not necessarily intelligent because it is not perfect, because it has its flaws. But if, more generally speaking, you give me a system that is such that any new ARC task I throw at it, like I can, I can make some new ones uh, tomorrow, for instance, I give them to your system. If it's always solving them, I will say, yeah, it's looking like you've got a system that's, that's got, you know, pretty close to human level uh, fluid uh, intelligence. This is one of the things that um, look, and I like the paper a lot. I think I think it serves as a really good um, 
you know, foundation for us to think differently about how to build intelligence. But but I have some some issues with it too as well. And one of them is this sort of necessity that it requires kind of white box analysis of things in order to figure out whether or not they're intelligent. Because for example, suppose time travel is actually possible. And you know, somebody like uh, 100 years from now looks back on your arc thing and writes an algorithm that that solves all all them in there because it actually knows about them all already and then ships it back into the past and we enter it into the competition. And no matter what new arc thing you throw at it, it sort of does well. And you say, well, yeah, you know, this thing's like kind of intelligent, but but we'd be wrong because in the sense in the paper, it's actually just encoded, you know, prior knowledge from the future. So we have to, we always have to kind of be able to look into the box, right? In order to evaluate intelligence in the way that you define in the paper. And so my question is one, isn't that a bit of a undesirable feature? And two, do you have any hopes for a more black box measure of intelligence? So basically the fundamental issue is that if intelligence is this conversion uh, ratio, then computing it requires knowing where you start from and you don't really have a way around it. So the, the thing to keep in mind is that the undermeasure of intelligence stuff is not so much meant to provide like a, a sort of like golden measure tape to measure anyone's intelligence or anything's intelligence. It is uh, more meant as a sort of cognitive device to help you think uh, about what the actual challenges are, uh, to help you kind of kind of reframe AI because they think that they have been pretty deep and long-standing conceptual misunderstanding intelligence, and that is really being, that's been holding the field back. So it's very much meant as uh, a cognitive device. Um, if you if you take a step back and, and you and you ask why uh, are we even trying to define intelligence and measure intelligence in the first place why is why is it useful at all i think it's useful to the extent uh, that it is actionable right a good definition and a, a good measure should be actionable so meaning it should help you think it should help you find uh, solutions and it, it, it should help you make progress in particular a good definition is a definition that will highlight the, the key challenges and help you think about it. And I think that's, that's what the, the paper does. And a good measure is a measure that gives you an actionable uh, uh, feedback signal towards building the right uh, uh, kind of system, right in the sense yeah. that it will be capable of doing more. And so that part, uh, the feedback signal, is what, is what ARC is trying to achieve. And um, the way it's trying to control for priors and experience is by assuming uh, a fixed uh, set of priors. And, and you're going to say, you know, every, every test taker is going to have these priors. This is the core knowledge priors. And then it controls for experience by only giving you a very small number of uh, input, input examples. And also by making sure the tasks are sufficiently novel and surprising that you're unlikely to have seen uh, very similar instances before. So now, of course, it's super flawed. So this is not 100% true, of course, but this is kind of like the, the, the platonic ideal that we are trying to get to. So that, for the record, that's a fascinating point to me, is that you view this more as a cognitive device to help guide us to produce better, better intelligent agents. It is not an endpoint. It's not like ARC is like the measure of intelligence and, and now all we need to do is solve ARC. This is not at all the point. It's like, it's one oh darn because i was doing pretty well on some of the examples i was hoping that would mean i was intelligent but oh well. and another interesting point because keith and i were looking at the paper again yesterday because it's, it's been um i haven't properly studied it since last year but um we were starting to talk about an alien that comes in from outer space and you know we, we don't know the the priors and the experience and then I was thinking in a way it might be a kind of lower bound on intelligence, right? Because, you know, if I play chess and if I beat someone with a higher ELO than me, then it only really tells me that I'm better, you know, as good as that person that I just beat. And similarly, this measure of intelligence, it only gives you a reading in the situation when you know what the conversion was. So if they are not converting anything, then you don't know. And another interesting byproduct of this is the more experienced you get, the less intelligent you get. So I would, um, I would push back against that last claim that the, the measure of intelligence as I define it is dependent on uh, how much experience you have. Um, because the, the amount of initial experience you have does not actually change at the conversion ratio if you, if you measure it via the right task. So you might need, so if, if you have a fixed uh, set of tasks, then yes, it does affect it. But if, you, if you're if able to renew 
your set of tasks and and uh, come up with tasks that are orthogonal uh, to the experience that you have, then it's not it's not going to actually affect the definition. So, but yeah, you're you're definitely right that if you take a pure black box approach and all you're looking at, like the only thing you can really measure is the behavior uh, uh, of a system. And unless you know how that behavior is achieved, you can't really tell immediately how much intelligence was, was involved in producing this behavior. If you look at an insect, they're capable of super complex behavior. Are they, are they crazy intelligent? Well, actually, you know, probably not. And the way you can really tell is by putting these systems out of their comfort zone, getting them to face novel situations and see how they adapt. And that's the measure of intelligence, it's adaptability, uh, the ability to, to deal with novel and unknown situations. But in order to give your system a, a novel and unknown situation, you need to have this white box understanding of what, what it already knows about. Yeah. And that, that's, that's not really something you can, you can work on. So can I ask about the, the generalization difficulty? Cause I, I sort of had some difficulty intuitively with some of, let's say, its limiting cases. So, for example, you know, the algorithmic complexity is highest. Let's just suppose we're dealing with problems, tasks, where we have whatever sets of integers mapped to zero, one values. You know, the, the algorithmic complexity will be greatest when that's just a random mapping. Like, I just assigned zero and one randomly to every single integer. And if I go to look at that generalization difficulty, it's going to be super high because the, the length of the program for any set is basically going to need to be, you'd have to encode the entire set as a hash table, right? So how does like this measure account for or help us avoid problems where we're confusing generalization difficulty with just increasing random, you know, randomness? Well, I mean, increasing randomness is a, a part of generalization difficulty, right? Generalization is really the ability to deal with uh, the stuff you don't know about, the stuff you don't expect. Uh, the stuff you haven't seen before. And randomness is, is a part of it. But you're right that if you just add randomness to a system, you're increasing the generalization difficulty, but you're not increasing it in a very interesting way, right? Because uh, you're increasing right. it in a way that's kind of orthogonal to an intelligent system's ability to deal with it, right? The, the best you can do is modify the system to be more robust to, to very much randomness. But that's that's not super interesting. What's really interesting is to, is to test the system's sensitivity to subtle analogies, is to make the system face novel uh, and unexpected situations that are actually derived from the past, but in interesting ways, right? Not just random ways. You've run this Kaggle challenge on, on Arc. And, you know, we, we know from systems such as AlphaGo and so on that bootstrapping intelligent like bootstrapping ai systems can be very valuable like playing them against each other and so on and um also we know that something like markets can be very efficient and and valuable and i imagine a system where you'd have agents creating arc tasks and other agents solving arc tasks and they're going some kind of money around and so on and, and this could be kind of a powerful engine for research teams to research anything like this and you know given that you have i don't know how much but you do have the backing of of google with a bit of capital in hand do you could you imagine could you imagine there you know being uh, a push for this kind of thing or or is it as of now an intellectual curiosity yeah um yeah so i i i don't have you know that much backing you from Google around this, uh, this kind of project. Uh, but yeah, so it would be super interesting to have this kind of two part system where one part is generating the task and one part is learning to, to solve them. And you could get them to do some kind of curriculum optimization, like the task generator network would not just generating, you know, not, it would, it would not just be trying to generate tasks that look like our tasks. It would be trying to generate tasks that correspond to level of generalization, difficulty, and complexity that is right below the limits of the student system that's trying to solve them. Kind of like, you know, the way a teacher would uh, provide exercises that are solvable, but challenging. They shouldn't be, they shouldn't be easy. They shouldn't be impossible. They should be solvable or challenging because that's 
how you get the most growth. So it's actually a system that's described at the very end uh, of the paper on the measure of intelligence. And I think one thing I point out in the paper is kind of like the, the pitfall you should avoid uh, falling into is that this system is circular, right? And the complexity you're going to see in your task, it needs to come from somewhere, right? Uh, it's like con conservation of complexity. So the, the, the system, this two-part system needs to have uh, a source uh, of intrinsic complexity. It needs to be grounded in the real world. And one way we can achieve that grounding, and I've been thinking about it, is I think we should, you know, like arc tasks are as they are today, they're made by me, and this is not a good setup because it's going to be biased. It's going to be very bottlenecked uh, as well. I think we should start crowdsourcing our tasks. There, there should definitely be, you know, a, a filtering system so that we make sure that we're only keeping our tasks that are interesting, that are not too easy, that are not too difficult, and that are only grounded in, in core knowledge priors. But if we have like this stream of novel art tests that contain intrinsic complexity and novel information, because they come from the real world, they come from human brains um, that, that have experienced the real world, and you use that as a way to ground your task generator, then you, you're starting to get a very interesting uh, three-part system, right? So I, I would I would love to, to actually get that started, to actually uh, uh, produce a, a uh, a V2 of Arc as soon as possible that will include, you know, 10x more tasks and that, that will be a crowdsourced and maybe something that will take the form of a continuous challenge where you, mm -hmm. where you have an API where you can draw a new Arc task and every time you draw a task, it's actually a different one <laughs> because yeah. you have so many of them. Uh, Gamify it. That'll make a fun game yeah. on, a, on a mobile app. There are actually a few people who've, uh, who've created, because Arc is, is open source and they're totally free license. There are a few people who have created uh, mobile apps where users solve Arc tasks, and apparently it's popular. So it, there's also the other angle you mentioned in the paper, which was which is pretty fascinating. You're talking about it almost right now, which is that, okay, let's, let's start thinking about how to map Arc performance to psychometric, you know, classic kind of psychometric tests. Are there any efforts that you're aware of underway right now to do that? Yes. Are you involved in? Okay. Yes. So there are two groups. Any ETAs? Yeah, ETAs, I'm not sure. So we did uh, we did a, a workshop at AAAI the other day, and there were two presentations about efforts that teams of people, so there are people who do neuropsychology, and they are using ARC in, uh, in very interesting ways. So there's a group at NYU and there's a group at MIT. And, uh, and uh, yeah, so they are using ARC for neuropsychology experiments, and it's, it's super cool. Amazing. Um, I want to switch over a little bit because, of course, you know, other than the measure of intelligence, you are also famous for a small library you wrote once in a while called Keras. And um... I, I, I wish I wish I wrote it, and <laughs> and then that was that. <laughs> no, I, yeah, it's it's been very much an ongoing project for the past six years. It, it was because I remember, you know, the days of TensorFlow One and and Theano and things like this and and Keras was just i think so helpful to a lot of people because it just easified all of this you know graph construction whatnot and and so on it just made it accessible to so many people and now with the development of you know things like pytorch and, and tensorflow 2 it almost seems like Keras is it has been kind of absorbed by TensorFlow too, right? There is tf.keras, and now I think the newest APIs are even sort of vanishing that a little bit. Do you do you see uh, Keras going away? Do you see it changing? Where where do you see it? Where do you see Keras going? Yeah, so going away, definitely not. I mean, we have uh, we have more users than, than ever before, and we're we still growing very nicely. Both inside Google, like more and more teams at Google are moving away from TensorFlow One and adopting Keras, and and outside Google as well. It's 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 a big market out there, and uh, there's definitely room for multiple frameworks. Um, evolving absolutely. I mean, Keras is is constantly evolving, but evolving uh, with continuity. Like if you look at Keras from 2016 or 2015, you look at Keras now you recognize is it the same thing and it's the same API. And yet it's actually a, a very different and much, much bigger set of features and things you can do with it. Uh, so evolving definitely. And um, there are, so several, so you, 
I think you asked, you know, about yeah, like uh, Keras is getting kind of merged into TensorFlow. Does it mean it's it's like fading away? So definitely not. So merging with TensorFlow was a good idea because it starts enabling a spectrum of workflows from the very high level, like cyclically like, to the very low level, NumPy like, and everything uh, in between. In the early days. Because Keras had to interact with multiple backends via a backend interface, it means you had this kind of like a barrier where as long as you use the Keras APIs, everything was super simple. It was psychically unlike, so very easy, very proactive, very fast. But if you wanted more customization, at some point you would hit that backend barrier and, and you had to revert to a TensorFlow-based or Tiano-based workflow that was low level, but when where you couldn't really leverage cars effectively. By removing the backend thing and just saying the flow together in one spectrum, then you get really this progressive disclosure of complexity when you can start out with the very high level thing, but then if you need to customize your training step, you have an API for that. And you, you can just mix and match seamlessly the low level TensorFlow stuff. Uh, with the high level car step. And that way you can achieve any, you can work with car and TensorFlow at the level of abstraction that you want. A uh, very, very easy high level or very, very low level, full flexibility. Uh, it's, it's really up to you. I'm going to point out the temptation here to analogize connecting type one with type two uh, reason. Yeah, why not? Well, why not? I was, I was just idea. about to do that. At least uh, Francois has great form for this because not only does he talk about having powerful and useful interfaces and abstractions in deep learning, he's he's been playing this game in, you know, in, in the library world for quite some time. But um, I wanted to right, touch right. on this quickly. We had a couple of people in our community um, asking you about Keras, actually. And uh, Robert Lange and, and I, I Ivan Fino said that apparently Theano has returned with Jackson XLA underneath and he wants to know, is, are there any plans to add it as a Keras backend? And Robert Lange also says, you know, just Jax on its own. Would you add that as a backend? And we've also had a couple of questions about PyTorch as well. Is there anything on, on the roadmap for that? Okay, so let, let's talk about Jax. I think Jax is an awesome project and the developers have really done a, a very, very interesting and very good job with it. And lots of people I like Jax, actually. So that said, adoption is not super high, I think. Google is probably the company where it's the most adopted, where you will find the most users. And even then, it's like a tiny, tiny, tiny fraction of, of total uh, machine learning usage at Google. But I think as a project, it's it's a beautiful project. It's elegant. It's powerful. It's great. So would I, would I like to add Jack's backend to Keras or PyTorch backend to Keras? So I, I want to say we've really moved away from this like interface backend kind of model. So it's precisely for the for the reason I was describing, because you want to achieve this spectrum of workflows without having this cliff where you go, you you fall from the high level down to the low level. We don't want cliffs. We don't because cliffs create silos of users where you have the high level users. You want a gradient. The, yeah, you want the you want gradient. gradient you want the spectrum, exactly. So that said, I think it would be super cool to have a sort of like re-implementation of the Keras API on top of JAX that would also achieve this grading. Uh, and that will still follow the Keras API spec. It will still be the same thing, uh, but on top of JAX. That said, so I would I would love to see something like this. This is also very low priority for us because we have the the actual current Keras, which uh, which we need to work on, which has lots of users. So we don't really have time to do this. But in theory, would it be cool? Yeah, sure. I would I would love to see something like this. So if I had tons of free time, I would I would. May probably build it, but in practice, I don't. Fantastic. Well, we got another question from Giovanni, actually. He says, uh, what does Francois think of Dr. Kenneth Stanley's book on the myth of the objective? Are, are you familiar with Kenneth Stanley's work about the tyranny of objectives and open-endedness? So I'm vaguely familiar with the name. I'm not really familiar with the book. Oh, okay. Well, sorry, <laughs> not not to worry. But it, it's um, it, Kenneth's been a huge inspiration for me, and and he he talks a lot about um, objectives leading to deception. So sometimes following um, an objective monotonically sends you in the wrong direction. And his solution to that is either quality, diversity, or more recently, open-endedness, which is that if you have an infinitude of objectives, in, in a sense, the system has no objective. And you can, you know, also with diversity preservation, you can overcome deceptive search spaces. But yeah, is it, um, you might have heard of the poet algorithm, which, which, he, which he was involved in. Yeah, absolutely. No, I'm aware of the, And so when it comes to your, your description of the, the problems, objectives, I, I completely uh, agree with that. One, one thing I mentioned in the paper is like the, 
the shortcut rule, which is that if you try to achieve <laughs> one thing, one objective, you're going to, you're going to achieve it. But the thing is, you're going to take every shortcut along the way for things that were not actually incorporated in your objective. And this leads to systems that are not actually doing what you wanted them to do. Like for instance, we built uh, chess playing systems because we hoped that a system that could play chess would have to uh, be able to feature reasoning, uh, 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 book learning, creativity, and so on. Turns out it just plays chess. <laughs> That's what it does. The, the same is true with uh, uh, challenges on Kaggle. The winning systems, they just optimize for the leaderboard ranking and they achieve it, but they achieve it at the expense of everything else that you might care about the system. Like, is the code base readable? No. Is it computationally efficient? No, it's it's actually terrible. You you could never put it in production. Is it explainable? No, and so on. Yeah. So it's like if you if you optimize for something, you get it, but you take shortcuts. Yeah, it's, exactly, and that, and that's very much what Kenneth says as well. I love what you said about shortcuts. You, you said in your New Ops presentation that if you optimize for a specific metric, then you'll take shortcuts on every other dimension not captured by your metric. And you said in a machine learning context, it's similar to overfitting, right? Because on on task specific skills, you actually lose generalization if you get good at a particular task. So it's completely orthogonal to to what you want. I know you're very well known for your skepticism of of the intelligence explosion, and what what I, I love about your conception of intelligence intelligence is that you think of it as as a system or as a process you say that intelligence is embodied right so you have a brain in a body acting in an environment and um, in 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 that context it makes sense that you would think that there are environmental kind of rate limiting steps to any kind of super intelligence right but um, I, I spoke to someone the other day who is of the other persuasion shall we say and this person was um, saying well what if you had a super super smart bunch of scientists I know you said in, in your rebuttal that if you look at the IQ of a scientist who is I don't know, Richard Feynman, for example, it's the same IQ as a mediocre scientist. Turns out that IQ only helps up to about 125 and then it stops helping you. But these people would say, oh, well, you know, what if what if every single scientist was an Einstein and intelligence is just making better decisions? They would consistently make better decisions and science would accelerate. A chimp doesn't understand how good a human is. So how would we understand what a super intelligent person would do? You know, they'd invent nanotech, they'd upload themselves into the matrix that do all of this stuff and somehow they would miraculously overcome do you know what i mean how would you respond to that yeah if every scientist was super intelligent in human terms that would in fact accelerate science but it would not really like accelerate science in a, in a linear fashion and, and very much not in an exponential fashion so uh, uh, I, I guess the main conceptual differences i have with uh, these folks is that they tend to credit everything humans can do to hum the human brain and, and they have this vision of intelligence as, you know, a brain in a jar kind of thing. And if you tweak the brain, it gets more intelligent. And intelligence is directly expressed as power. Uh, if you're more intelligent, if you have a higher IQ, you can do more things, you can solve more problems and so on. And in particular, you can build a better brain. And, and by the way, there, there's not really any, any uh, uh, practical evidence that's it's true. But I view intelligence yeah, more as this holistic thing that, okay, you have the brain, but actually the brain is in a body which gives it access to a certain set of uh, uh, actions it can do instead of set of perception primitives. And this body is an environment which gives it access to a set of experiences, a set of problems it can solve. And to a very large extent, you know, the brain is just, it's not a, so much a problem-solving algorithm, like a problem synthesis engine, uh, as it is a big spawn and you put it in an environment will absorb experiences from that environment. And um, one thing that's super important to understand if you, want, if, you, if you really think deeply about intelligence is that most of our expressed intelligence does not come from here. It is externalized intelligence. So externalized intelligence can be, can be many things. Um, if I look up uh, uh, something online that's externalized intelligence, Google is part of my brain. If I write a Python script to test some idea that's externalized intelligence, my laptop uh, is part of my cognition uh, and so on. But it's actually, it goes much further than that. Most of our cognition is crystallized, decrystallized output of someone, someone else's thinking. And the process through which we get access to all these uh, accumulated outputs of people's thinking is civilization, right? And like 99% of the things you think 
or the behaviors uh, you, you act, behaviors you execute, you did not invent them. You did not solve the underlying problem yourself. You, you're just copying uh, a solution you've seen. Like we're in the middle of the pandemic, uh, you're probably washing your hands after you went outside. And that's a very smart behavior. Uh, but did you invent it? Did you come up with that? No, actually. Other people came up uh, uh, with that. You did not also uh, come up with the infrastructure that enables you to do it in the first place. And so, and this is true, you know, for even the, the most uh, intimate of your thoughts, you're thinking with words that you did not invent. You're thinking with concepts uh, that you did not invent or that you did not derive from your own experience. They, they really come from other people, from this accumulation of past generations. And if you want to um, enhance the expressed intelligence uh, of people, then this is actually the system you need to, to tweak and improve, not the human brain, but civilization. Right. In a way, that seems like a contradiction because you're talking about the externalization of knowledge, not intelligence. So by your own definition, doesn't that, isn't that the opposite of intelligence? That, that's a great point. So I'm, I'm relating express intelligence. So I was specifically saying express intelligence as opposed to fluid intelligence. And what express intelligence uh, means in this context is something very different from what we, we talk about in the measure of intelligence. It means intelligent behavior. Right. And in particular, I think the, the ability to solve problems that you encounter as an individual. Typically, when you solve a problem as an individual, you're actually using a solution you've uh, you found somewhere else. It is, there are not that many problems that as an individual you solve from scratch in your own lifetime. But here's the thing is that if you're able to actually solve something novel yourself, you have the ability to write about it. You have the ability to communicate it. And then the next generation can, can benefit from it. So let me just pose a kind of a, a counter argument to this, though. Suppose, um, you know, suppose you're reading a novel about, uh, I don't know, a kind of planet of, of the apes or something, which was, which was a planet that had a, a life form similar to ours, but with a significantly lower, lower IQ, right? And and, you know, a human being shows up there one day and, and these things start writing about this. Hey, this weird, you know, alien just showed up here and, and we captured it. You know, we ran some tests on it and we figured out it's really intelligent. You know, it's much more intelligent than than any of us are. And and we're worried what's going to happen when, you know, 100 of them show up instead of just this initial explorer. And some other other of these guys were like, ah, don't worry about it. You know, they've they've got two legs and two arms like us and most of what they are is kind of outside of their brain. So, you know, I'm, I'm not, I'm not really worried about it. We would be reading that with trepidation, right? Because we know that when this more intelligent species with more fluid intelligence, more externalized intelligence, better technology, all this kind of stuff shows up, those guys are going to get wiped out. And it's actually happened like many times throughout human history, not that humans were more fluid intelligence showed up and killed off, you know, other people, but humans that had more externalized intelligence or more, you know, represented intelligence and technology certainly showed up and dominated. Absolutely. Them. You're, you're, you're saying it yourself that you, when it has happened in history, it was not fundamentally about one people having smarter brains, but one people having higher technology. But that, that is not something that is attributable to, to intelligence itself right there's a connection there if you did have a group of species or whatever that was much more intelligent they will have advanced technologically much faster and further in any given amount of time all else being equal right it depends on many factors and that's kind of my point is that is your brain a factor yes absolutely it is but there are other factors like we were just talking about the development of technology so in that case the, the critical factor was not the brain but this superstructure, in particular, communication and environmental constraints around it. The direction in which a civilization develops is a direct function of the specific challenges it, it, it encounters that come from its environment, that comes from the, its surrounding enemies, and so on. And techno technological development advances the fastest when you have a civilization that are dealing with very harsh challenges, but that are not quite harsh enough to wipe them out um, because that's what uh, forces them to, to develop as fast as it can survival. Basically. So this is actually a very good example where 
the critical factor was the superstructure that, that guided development civilization was not actually the brain. But of course, yeah, if, if everyone is smaller, then civilization will, will uh, advance faster. But the, my, my point is that there are many factors and that by tweaking one factor, the brain, if the brain stops being the bottleneck, then immediately some other factor will be the bottleneck. There are uh, civilization, civilizations that have not actually advanced uh, very much at all because they, they simply did not face any challenges. And did they have worse brains? No, actually they had exactly the, the same brain. Uh, but somehow the, the outcome was different because something else uh, than the brain turned out to be the bottleneck, like uh, a lack of environmental challenge, for instance, right? I'm fascinated by scale and bottlenecks in systems, actually, because I work in a large corporation. And when you have role fragmentation and lots of different businesses and lots of different organizational structures, some people might decide to structure themselves based on data domain or based on organization or based on something else. And you can think of it topologically. And I think human society is very similar to this. And I'm not sure whether, you know, evolution would lead itself to one particular topology, but the environmental structures and the ways that we organize ourselves can create incredible bottlenecks. And that seems to be where the real interesting um, stuff goes on rather than the individuals. And I, I think you would agree with that, Francois. Yeah, absolutely. If, if you take two companies and in one company, the average IQ is like 15 points higher, but it has a terrible organizational structure and terrible incentives and the promo process is super broken or something. That company is actually going to perform worse than the more progressive, innovation encouraging company that has a very nice organizational structure and where people are actually more mediocre. Uh, maybe uh, maybe they have uh, on average 15 points or less in, in IQ, but they're actually going to do a better job because they have the better superstructure. Right? Yeah, it, it's it's fascinating. The problem is in, in most corporations, you can't actually design the information architecture to be more efficient because everything is so decentralized and fractionated. You can only do it in pockets. And if you try and fix something in one part of the organization, everyone else will say, well, my requirements are different. I'm not going to wait for you. I'm going to do it my own way. And it's yeah. actually a really, really difficult thing to do well. To, to sum up the, the, the whole like intelligence explosion thing, the, the point is really that it's a system you have to look at holistically, to look at it holistically. And just by tweaking one factor, which is the intelligence of, a, of an individual human brain, uh, the, then what this means is this factor starts being the bottleneck. But that means some other factor in the system, because there are, there's an infinity of factors at work, will become the bottleneck. And by just focusing on one factor, you're not going to actually lift uh, all the boats. Yeah, I, and I, I actually agree with you. However, you know, I do want to say, I think we just don't know. I think both sides of the intelligence, quote unquote, explosion really can't say for certain that it will or will not pose, you know, a mortal threat to humanity. Like, I think we have to accept that it's at least a risk factor. Right. And we have to be very careful about, you know, in the future when we start embodying, you know, if we find general intelligence, we need to be cautious. If we come up with something that looks like general intelligence, there is absolutely some risk potential around it. However, you know, I've, I've never seen anything coming anywhere close to that. In fact, the, the systems that we have today, they feature almost no intelligence whatsoever. So I think it's, it's, it's a bit early to start planning. And even if we get into that sure. conversation, I think Francois would say that intelligence must be specialized, right? Because of the no free lunch theorem. If, if you define intelligence as your ability to solve problems, then yeah, it's going to be specific to a scope uh, of problems, a kind of problems. Um, and uh, like, yeah, what, what the no free lunch theorem is saying is basically, if you want to learn something from data, you have to make assumptions about it. Uh, which is why, you know, a confident, for instance, is a great fit for image data. It's not really a great fit for natural language processing um, because it makes different sure, assumptions about the structure. Of the it data. doesn't give me a lot of comfort, though, because I, I'm, I'm fairly certain that whatever the first AGI that gets created, it's going to be highly specialized for killing other people because it's going to be a, a military, you know, secret project probably that finds it. You know, it's, um, I, I, I don't know, but what I know is that right now we don't have anything coming close to AGI. <laughs> it's probably going to be actually a system that just displays you ads 
Like if like <laughs> if you know where, enough, if you th if we see where the most money is right now, the the first AGI is probably just going to like write not only display but write the perfect ad for you on the fly. You know, it's like it, it knows what you ate and you know. I, I know you're joking, but I actually think on the, on the more serious note, I think that's highly unlikely because of the shortcut of the sorry because of the shortcut rule. I don't think an, a general intelligence is going to be created by the military. It's not going to be created by uh, a system that's trying to show you ads because these are specific goals. And so if you mm -hmm. try to optimize for these specific goals, you're going to end up with a very specialized system. In order to build a general intelligence, you need to be optimizing for generality itself. So it's going to yeah. come from... If it, if, it, if it comes from the applied, either it's going to come from the academic side where you have researchers who are actually optimizing for generality itself, who set generality as their goal. Or if it's come from the applied side, it's going to come from people who have problems where they have to deal with extreme novelty and certainty and unpredictability. Yeah. So it's not going to be as, it's not going to be the military. Or, um, I don't know where this is going to be. One of the things that interested me about Kenneth Stanley was that he, you know, he says the reason we can't monotonically optimize on objectives is because of deception, which means sometimes you need to get a lot worse before you get better. His original conception was quality diversity, which basically means if, if you optimize for novelty, that's something that you can optimize on monotonically. And also, if you look at evolution, where there is a cacophony of problems and solutions, you know, divergently being generated, then as an information accumulator, you can optimize on that monotonically. And your conception of, in, of intelligence is generality. And that also appears to be a monotonic increase throughout advancing levels of, of intelligence. So I think that's quite interesting. Anyway, um, Francois Cholet, th this has been my dream come true to th have you on the show. Thank you so much. It really means a lot to us. And yeah, I appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah, thanks thank a lot for having me uh, on the podcast. It's, it's really my pleasure. This was, this was super fun. Thanks a lot. And thank you for Keras, yeah, by the way. Thanks. Too. <laughs> I'm glad it's useful. We're going to jump straight into the post-show analysis. Okay, well, I'm going to mention you, you did really well, Tim. That, that trickle of sweat that just was running down your face the whole time. Yeah. Not very noticeable. So I think you can, you can relax. You did. <laughs> that was fun. No, that was really, I think that it went fun. really well. Yeah. yeah, it was it was a dream come true. I, I was actually, I was very pleasantly kind of interested in how he, he framed, you know, the measure of intelligence paper. Like, look, it's not really about the measure per se. It's just mm -hmm. that this is, this is a cognitive framework, a cognitive tool for thinking about where to go and a guidepost for building more generalizable or more general intelligences say like that. I totally, totally agree to. And it's quite, you know, quite a fascinating goal, which is like, here's a framework to help us think more in the direction we need to be thinking. Yeah. And it's so surprising that the, like the arc challenge is at like 20% solved only because you know, he self admits that it's, it's flawed, right? And because he, like he makes the tasks, and you know there's only finitely many and and you know you kind of you see the kind of tasks he makes you know on in the public set you, you would think that not someone would come up with an intelligent thing but someone would co come up with like a a smart set of shortcuts to like solve yeah. that sucker right but it's still at 20 percent. i don't know whether that's due to just you know not too many people investigating it um or whether well, it's really actually a hard problem. And if it is a yeah. hard problem, you know, it's... Well, it's, it's fascinating too, because if he, if he achieves what he wanted, which was getting it more outsourced, right? Like getting all the intelligent people all around the world contributing to art problems and refining mm -hmm. them over time, I think actually that community project would help the core knowledge people and that line of research and mm -hmm. figuring out, okay, what, what is a catalog of all the core knowledge, right? It's like yeah. in, back in school, we used to call these prime thoughts because we would, we would play these brain teasers all the time. And we realized that there were patterns, right? Like, well, this brain teaser requires the concept of coloring, like mm -hmm. with a red black tree where you add an additional variable that kind of lets you solve the problem. And if we could really have a nice catalog of here's all the core knowledge, here's all the like problem solving techniques. I think that would be really yeah. powerful. I mean, well, we, we kind of had that. So this woman, Elizabeth Spelkey, she came up with about six core knowledge systems, right? And, and that, and the arc challenge uses four of them. So objectness and intuitive physics, one 
agentness to elementary geometry and topology three numbers counting quantitative comparisons so the two that weren't in there are places and social partners now the thing is i think we may discover new ones well yeah, well, yeah maybe we will but the, the, i'm surprised that we did as well as 20 percent because if you think about it imagine if you just guessed the classification on imagenet when you've got a thousand classes 20 percent would be amazing wouldn't it and we we've got a similar amount of diversity of tasks on arc right and what's interesting as well is that all of those different tasks that have been created by Francois, they all tie back to just four priors, right? Which means, I don't know whether it's uniformly distributed, but 20% seems really good for just guessing ops on a DSL. Yeah, it's, there's there's two things. So for, first, I would have thought that if someone if someone came up with something that solves more than 5%, it's going to be like immediately at 95%. Like just because they've they've sort sort of cracked the problem, and and then you know there might be a few outliers, but you know if I, I would guess that's kind of a task that if you hit the correct solution, it's going to be like boom, you're you're there, and and that's not which is surprising. And the, the other thing is, I I don't I don't feel it's surprising that there's so few priors. What I do think is that the space of these priors is still way too large. Like so. If, if you just think about something like object, because in in these arc tasks, there are, I feel, so many more priors than uh, just the core knowledge things. Because, so one of them is like, you have the, you have like this thing, and then you have this thing, and the solution is like, it goes boop, right? It, it, go, it like bounces, but this is... Selection. Yeah, but, but like the fact that we, we recognize like this is a wall or something, but there right. is no... There, there's no no prior to says like a wall needs to be straight. The wall could be like any you know any old any shape at all. And the fact that this is much more core knowledge, right? Like in you know we yeah. we build stuff out of straight walls. And I think you know, I think I agree with you, which is I think I think what you're getting at. Correct me if I'm wrong, but it's that the way in which the core knowledge is kind of specified right now is is vague, right? Mm -hmm. There's a vagueness yes. to it, and I think if we actually start to try and codify that more in some type of a mathematical language, Tim, I think it's going to expand like the scope of that. We're going to end up with more core knowledge concepts really than, than just six. We'll need to make them finer grained. And I'm really excited, you know, to see that develop because this has been for me a long wonder, right? Which is what are the, and, and in a rigorously defined way, what are these core concepts, these core bits of knowledge that make human cognition so powerful? Yeah, and there's also, because Yannick made the point about brittleness, right? Even in topological space, you still have brittleness, but but the, the solution was to create powerful abstractions, right? But how would that work with the priors? Because if you think about it, you can recombine many of the priors to come up with powerful abstractions and you might find that it doesn't actually filter down to to that many but the question is how many things are there remember when we spoke to Walid Subba yeah. and he was talking about he's got them somewhere in a powerpoint deck he just wouldn't give them to <laughs> us but you know part of part of why I, why I agree with Yannick that there are finer grain concepts are more important i think probably stems from a lot of the computer science um, education that I had were, were when we were devising algorithms to do one thing or another. You get these little hints at kind of like clever bits of core knowledge that was used to solve this problem. Like when you study quicksort and it's like, you know what, like I'm just going to randomly choose an element. Well, random selection is kind of a bit of core knowledge. And then I'm just going to partition by that and then repeat, you know, or things like I don't know how to balance this tree the way it is, but if I color stuff, like add in red black nodes, I can now overlay a computation that, you know, so there's all these little bits that, you know, that's what's fascinating about computer programming is it, is it really strikes at the heart of this cognition and this core knowledge and how to written, you have to do it rigorously, right? You can't just vaguely go, oh, you know, you just kind of sort it and merge them. You got to define like what that means and it's fascinating dynamic programming yeah i'm always i'm always a bit amazed by people who have just kind of sort of learned programming because it it's it's almost like a, a different world in that they'll 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 do it's like oh okay i need to solve this problem can i can i copy paste this code here and it works like 20 percent of the time but not fully yeah <laughs> but then on the other side of the coin to that um, so when I was working in um, 
you know, quantitative trading, right? We had these these massive globally integrated automated trading systems. And I mean, some of the bizarre, I don't want to call them hacks, but some of the bizarre sort of piecewise linear equations slash hacks, whatever, that actually work in reality. You know, you sit there and you look at them and go, when I first went in there, fresh out of academia, and I started seeing things like, oh, this is crap. Like, I'm going to figure out some continuous equation that, you know, fits this piecewise linear thing, and it's going to do better. Nope. Like, it didn't do better. I couldn't find any continuous thing that did better. It's like, you know, options pay off, right, is this this piecewise linear thing. And and you're like, oh, that's, oh, well, there should be some continuous, like, thing in there. It's like all these weird, you know, piecewise, discrete, like kind of hybrid things between continuous and discrete work. And 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 that's weird. It was weird to me and still weird to me. Interesting. But I've got to say, so my, my main three take homes from Cholet today, I, I really love Cholet. So one, intelligence is generalization. I think that's super powerful. Two, his idea that deep learning is really good for value centric abstraction. And because of the manifold hypothesis, lots of natural data has some kind of manifold which you can interpolate on. But lots of discrete problems do not have that, right? And it, my, my mind was thinking, well, does that mean that we can just use, because it's because of SGD, you can't even learn the manifold even if it did exist. But he's saying that it doesn't exist. For discrete problems, the manifold might be there or it might only be there in parts. So that was right, interesting. Right, yeah. And then the third thing that fascinated me about Cholet is, is he talks about these systems and, and bottlenecks in systems and we shouldn't be thinking about individual brains we should be thinking about the externalization of knowledge yeah and and the way he the way he described this um what what he thinks like a hybrid system should look like which is sort of you have a perception layer and then a a discrete search layer and then on top of that kind of a, another uh, fuzzy layer that guides the search that can be deep learning again and i think we're we're like halfway there on the top with the top very much looks like alpha zero right which is kind of a discrete search that is guided by neural networks and the bottom layer we have too because that's just our you know regular neural networks i i think we we have a big trouble in how to connect the two in a in a single unified way such that we can learn them right because the best yeah. we can do right now right. is is right we can we can plug a, a pre-trained network onto alpha zero or something like this but we can't really we don't really have it figured out yet how to connect the all this stuff a good example of that is the the neural turing machines like how it's so hard to to optimize them, right? Mm -hmm. And I think, and not only do we need these kind of three components that that nicely integrate and are optimizable, we have to be able to modularize and componentize mm -hmm. and connect multiple instances of those things together in some, you know, weird topological network to really achieve, like kind of the capsule network kind of vision where each of the capsules yeah. is maybe one of these units. Mm -hmm. And then they're part of, so it's like a fractal, you know, kind of these fractal layers of, of yeah. those pieces I, I, don't, I don't know whether i was misunderstanding you before yanni but with the alpha zero thing my conception is that has been quite hard coded so you're you're searching through let's say a bunch of deep learning models and the way you search is quite opinionated what chalet is talking about is have a very basic dsl mm -hmm. and in that topological space you you just search and and you start to modularize and you start to create functions and abstractions and you have from a software engineering point of view you start to build a library of functions that have been written in code that do certain things right and th that's that's different isn't it to alpha zero well the the alpha zero is made yeah specifically to to search over actions in in some kind of rl space yeah i mean that what what he describes is certainly much more abstract in that you you search over applications of the dsl and the dsl itself is not is like a perceptive dsl that in in itself is described by these lower level neural networks but i mean in in s i i just it that just came to my mind when he described the system i'm like oh the to the, the top part looks very much like you know alpha zero because that's essentially neural network guided search is something we we already already do though yeah i i i think i'm not sure i i think just that 
the reality is even a bit more fuzzy because what you do as a as a human there's also some part of hierarchical system to it in that you can you can do this but you can do it hierarchically right you can you you can be like okay i'm gonna right. i have to solve you know i have this high layer search and then each of the search things goes through maybe a fuzzy thing but then you you again search at to solve the sub problem and um there there is also and you can do it at will too by the way like yeah. you can you can scan an image and you get this type one that sort of finds a bunch of objects and then you do this type two thinking where you start reasoning about those and in your mind you can kind of zoom in on one let me mm. like zoom in on that tree and now like now I've got the bark, you know, pieces of the bark as objects and bugs and reason about. So you have this ability to transcend mm -hmm. the process and tune it and move it around. Yeah, this this self like the that that's the whole consciousness aspect, right? That's even like apart from intelligence, you have the ability to to introspect the whole thing, yeah. and yeah. that probably is a big part of intelligence. I mean, I guess you could have intelligence without consciousness, but you know, there is an argument to be made that the fact that you can introspect your own processes contributes in big part to the furthering of intelligence. Yeah, I, I would separate consciousness and, and intelligence, but it, it, the thing that hit me the most on his newest presentation was when he said intelligence is literally sensitivity to abstract analogies. So we were talking about the kaleidoscope. The main thing here with intelligence is that there is so much repetition in the universe. Right, but it's repetition in this funny way where it's it's sort of fuzzy rep repetition. Yeah. Like, yeah. sure, the solar system kind of resembles galaxies, kind of resembles you know, but but then there are these little weird differences, these asymmetries, and you know, like the universe is a fascinating place. I mean, and and I don't it's, know something. Yeah. Right, that's not when you say you you have to make analogies, which is I can I can absolutely see you know this and and me. I think my question was formulated a bit dumb where I said, you know, if the line is squiggly, uh, what I more meant is that, you know, in in that case, it's not a line, it's a squiggly line. And it, it, the same with the social situations, you know, that it's like, okay, that, that person over there kind of doesn't like me. But then in the next social situation, it's kind of a person that doesn't like you and has a gun or or something like this. I, I almost feel like... Or a group no, of people that you or a now group consider of, like, as a like, single, like, single sure, object. Sure, they are similar in some way, but it's never the exact same thing. So this reasoning by analogy does work, but you always do your little modifications on top specific to the situation. And your I'm, I'm sure there, there's a place in his framework for this, but it's it's just, again, it's it's like a lot more complex well, than, yeah. I think that's what he called, I think that's abstraction. At least that, you mm -hmm. know, that was prior to today, my, my concept of abstraction was similar to that, which it's removing the in, insignificant details. Mm -hmm. So you're able, you're, you're able to take whatever, you know, some, yep. you know, object thing, situation, doesn't yep. matter, and kind of strip away all the stuff that doesn't matter for whatever your purpose is. That's mm -hmm. abstraction. And, you know, I think one of the weird things is that, and this is kind of the, the unreasonable effectiveness of mathematics, right? Is that abstracting actually produces things that are useful. You know, that abstraction, I think the fact that abstraction helps with generalization is a very not well understood kind of mystery in a sense. Like, why should abstraction help generalize? But it does. Like, in the real world, that's what happens. Though the, yet abstraction in, Though abstraction has to be somehow specific to what what you want to do, like like right, a, right, you, yeah. you're right. An apple is an apple only if you, you know you're looking for food or non food. But when it comes and to and it's a sphere if you want to shoot it out of out of a potato cannon. Exactly, but when it comes to you know separating fruit by ripeness, then it's not an apple is an apple. Then all of a sudden, this apple has much more in common with this orange, right? Mm -hmm, so the mm -hmm. even the way how you abstract, it's not like it's not like we can just, you know, plug in our ResNet 50 and then boom, we get an embedding vector and that's our abstraction. But the, how you abstract is also incredibly specific to what you want to do. Yeah, and, and that's it, what, yeah. and I agree with Saba that this is an empirical question, mm -hmm. right? You know, like he's kind of like these concepts or whatever, it's an empirical question. And Chalet's, I think the, the ARC project, if it ever becomes this crowdsourced thing, 
is going to give us lots of data to start thinking about this empirically and it's going to be really fascinating i mean this needs to be on the, like on. this is a this is a prime blockchain project because you you can <laughs> you can probably like you can probably even no. zero you can zero knowledge prove that you can solve uh, a, a given set of arc problems right you you can probably create zero knowledge so you wouldn't even have Maybe. to show your solution and if there, you know, people would put up arc problems and they, you know, if you want to try them, you will have to put up some money. And if you can solve it, you know, the, the creator of the challenge gives you some money or, or something like this. Like this, this, maybe, this could be fascinating. Maybe you could do, you know, homomorphic like uh, arc, right? Or like you don't even... You somehow, like you're saying, you can just prove you can solve the problem without ever you having seen the problem, but just an encryption of it. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, normally, homomorphic encryption comes after blockchain in the same sentence. Exactly. <laughs> and we make a nifty. Of, we make a nifty of it. Yeah. What else can we get in there, Tim? We, so we got blockchain, homomorphic encryption. What else? What can we throw in there? Bitcoin. Can't we just say people should have to pay through Bitcoin if if they if somebody wins a challenge on Arc? Like, we'll get our own token of it. Arc, Arc coin. Oh God, hold on. I got to get that domain right now. <laughs> I, I, I want to know, by the way, so the whole point of the Arc, diversity of tasks for developer aware generalization, which means the developer could not have conceived of the task. Mm -hmm. But if all of the tasks are representing four human priors, then how is that developer aware of generalization? Because the developer would be aware of all of those priors. Of the priors, right? But not not of the the task, right? That's the the control is the control. Like th that's what he said. You have to know the start of where your your white box analyzing from, and the the start is not clean slate. But the start mm -hmm. here is these four priors. So it's it's kind of the diff between you give the developer those four priors. What can the developer come up with just from that, right? Yeah, so that, because yeah. I think I think there's a lot of information leakage there, and you implicitly said the same thing because you said once you solve it, you know, once you solve some of them, you've solved all of them. Okay, artcoin.com is available for the it's, but it's it's a premium domain, so it's three hundred bucks. Should we get it? Because it has coin in it, I guess. A R C O I N. We need to, we, we need to, we we need to uh, figure out, figure out something cooler, like no art coin. Okay. I mean, I'm no, not gonna no, it, no. I don't care enough to grab it. <laughs> <laughs> right. Anyway, we should draw this to a close, ladies and gentlemen. But yeah, thank Somebody you very much for listening. We publish. Yep. <laughs> thank you so it's much. Been, it's been emotional. We've recently reached 10K subscribers, actually. So uh, yeah, yeah, thank you very much. We're still going to continue the show now that we've had Shaleo. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. Uh, I thought this was the end. I thought we were going <laughs> to cap it with Shaleo. Well, I mean, to be honest, we, we might as well just stop now. <laughs> <laughs> Anyway, we're, see ya, folks. Yeah. Thanks a bunch. Um, Bye. I really hope you've enjoyed the episode today. Remember to like, comment, and subscribe. We love reading your comments, and we'll see you back next week. <laughs>